getting a little bit of I went to Good morning, everyone. Let's get started. I'm Jen Gardy, your STPH Faculty Rounds Coordinator, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the last rounds of the 2017 calendar year. Um, before we start, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered on the lands of the Musqueam people, and we are grateful to be able to carry on the sort of learning, dialogue, and storytelling that's taken place here thousands of years. We're also grateful that unlike last December's rounds, this one didn't get canceled due to snow. Uh, I know there's like an exorcist type fog outside, but we all seem to get here anyway, so hooray for that. Today's rounds is all about technology, and technology I think is a bit of a double-edged sword. We all recognize the role it plays in our lives, whether it's our smartphone telling us how to get someplace and avoid traffic jams, or whether it's not having to stay up all night wondering what the lyrics to that 80s TV show theme song were, because now you can just find them on YouTube. Uh, but at the same time, it's also introduced a lot of complications, I think especially for our younger generation, where you've got um, people dealing with issues, everything from sedentary lifestyles that go along with screen time to issues of bullying and harassment on the internet. But today's technology stories that we're going to tell are all positive stories, and positive stories coming from right here in SPPH and BC. We've got three speakers, as is customary these days, with rounds, multiple big picture perspectives on an issue, um, and the way we're going to structure it today is first up we'll have our very own Associate Professor Kim McGrail talking about the role of telemedicine in reaching populations that would otherwise be difficult to reach, and then from BC CDC we've got Clinical Associate Professor Mark Gilbert and uh, iBoost Immunity content strategist Ian Rowe, who are both going to share some of the work that they've used, uh, that they've done using online platforms to reach people, whether it's around issues like getting tested for STIs or boosting immunity in the community, getting people on board with promoting vaccination. As befits a technology themed rounds, you may use technology to answer or uh, send questions to us. You can tweet questions with the hashtag SPPH rounds, um, especially for those of you who might be tuning in um, over the web. For those of you who, hello people on the web, um, for those of you who are joining us online via Adobe Connect, you can type your questions in the box and uh, Stefan will make sure they get to us. Those of you in the room can ask questions with a mic later on or um, via Twitter. And I'm going to click this. Um, this will show up again at the end of the presentation, but you could use technology, an online survey, to collect your continuing medical education, credits, um, learning objectives. Uh, I will list them here. I will not read them out, but like I said, it's telemedicine, it's digital public health, and it's online learning and education. And one COI disclosure uh, via Ian, the iBoost Immunity Program, um, which as you'll hear, distributes vaccines um, through the UNICEF program, and those are supported um, by a couple of entities named here. So without uh, further ado, I'll turn it over to Kim McGrail for the first part of her presentation. Welcome, Kim. Thanks, Jen. And thanks for the opportunity to be here and to be able to present with um, such great colleagues. Um, so I'm going to give you a very high level view of this um, project that we worked on. And I just want to acknowledge up front that we did this in partnership and with funding from Canada Health InfoWave. And so we conducted here at UBC uh, an analysis of administrative data related to the question we'll be talking about. And at the same time, Canada Health InfoWay conducted a survey of patients and uh, interviews with physicians. And I will only be able to touch on um, that uh, quite briefly in this presentation, um, but just so you know that the whole package um, was done. And this is uh, available in a publication in the Journal of Medical Internet Research. Um, and I have to use. Little area, just click on the keypad, the point is. Okay. So just as 
a, a starting point, um, we need to get a, a, a common understanding of what we mean by virtual visits, which is my shorthand for telemedicine. If we think about telehealth in general, um, we, can, we can kind of trace it through, you, you could be talking about physician to patient communication or physician to physician communication. Um, you could be talking about patient portals, so just kind of web-based access to information. Uh, some home-based telemonitoring services where you're actually um, looking at vital signs and so on with, with patients in their homes. Or we can be actually talking about visits between um, patients and physicians, and it's that that we really want to think about here. And then, of course, within the visit realm, you could be thinking about asynchronous visits that might be mediated with uh, email or something like that. But really, our research was about this virtual visit, so the idea of an actual visit um, with video-based technology, so you can see a clinician face-to-face, -face. and more specifically, we really concentrated on primary care uh, virtual visits in British Columbia. So there's lots of things we could think about how telehealth and virtual visits um, might actually help uh, with the healthcare system and healthcare delivery. And I'm, I'm being a little bit vague on the, on the virtual visits versus telehealth because the, the literature in this area is developing rapidly, but it's not that mature. And so there's not a lot that's specifically about virtual visits. So we, we kind of took a broader frame and kind of putting the background together here. So if you think about the use of technology in healthcare, it can reduce the effects of geography, which is a very big deal in a place like British Columbia. It, it can increase availability and accessibility of healthcare services. It can reduce wait times and, and travel costs and things like that for patients. On the other hand, it could uh, exacerbate the digital divide. If we're, we're, we're thinking about technology as mediating um, visits, then it's only going to be available to people who are actually uh, have that technology available to them. It could discourage preventive care just by the nature of the kind of interaction we're talking about. Maybe there isn't a, a less in, of a, an incentive to provide uh, preventive care if you're talking to somebody um, through some sort of assistive device. Um, and it could reduce continuity of care. Um, what we know for sure from the literature is that uh, they seem, it seems that virtual visits or telehealth mediated visits uh, tend to be focused on more minor conditions, um, prescription refills, respiratory infections, that sort of thing. Uh, they tend to be associated with a lot of prescribing. There was a stat in the United States that 77% of uh, virtual visit telehealth visits ended with a prescription. Um, and we don't know about longer term side effects or the effects on overall use of care in the system. And that's really what we wanted to focus on here. So part of the context for this, and I have to just kind of skate over this very briefly, is that the, this technology developed and it was able to get into public funding in the healthcare system because of other things that were going on in the telehealth world. And so um, when this, this Medio company developed uh, a very nice app that you could download onto your phone and it met all of the security requirements for enabling video contact between a provider and a patient. And so they were able to put this in place and use and, and make it publicly funded. So the, the arrangement was that the uh, Medio company would take part of the fee, this is the original institution of this, they would take part of the fee from the physician and in exchange offer a sort of concierge service for getting patients into a virtual waiting room and then providing um, that, that um, vid video service to physicians. And so this BC was the first place in Canada where these things in primary care were actually embedded in the public system and that's part of the reason we had an opportunity to look at the effects of this. And this is what happened. It became um, in October of uh, 2012 is when the public funding started. And you can see what happens um, in the next year. It, it started ticking up because that was only a partial year that it was covered in 12-13. But then it's this exponential growth, really, in the number. Now, if you look at the, the graph here, it's still a relatively low number, but it, but it grew very, very quickly. And so there was a, a really strong interest in trying to get a handle on what this meant and what it particularly meant for patient care. So these are the questions we asked in our research. Um, are they substitutes or complements for regular primary care? So is this displacing, is this a, you know, an alternative to an in-person visit or is it just an add-on to cost and, and experience of care? And then we also really wanted to know who is using these services and who is providing these services. We used administrative data for all of this. 
And like I said, this is complemented by other survey work that was done by Canada Health in Bowie. Uh, we included all patients in British Columbia and all primary care physicians, and we did both a descriptive and time series analysis looking at the years 2010, 11 to 13, 14, because that was um, when we started, that was the most recent data available. In terms of patients, we had age and sex and lo the location of residence. We also um, looked at the socioeconomic status based on the neighborhood where people live, and um, we were able to uh, assess their need for healthcare services using the uh, ACG system from Johns Hopkins, which is a standard case mix system. In physicians, we have um, we looked at age, sex, and uh, type of practice variable. Okay, so huh, that's interesting. I don't know if I'm, I'm not completely missing here. There's some things missing. Okay, so I have to just picture a graph here. <laughs> <laughs> Who uses virtual visits in BC? What what this should show you. Um, at the patient level is that, as we would expect, younger people are more likely to be using these services. There are, is used across all age groups, but it's a sort of 20 to 44 category, um, which is the most likely users. Um, in terms of, what's that? Don't be nice, don't get the switch. I'll just keep talking when you do that. That's right. um, in terms of, of health authority, one of the interesting things we found is that the highest use was in the north, um, so that speaks to the, the ability of this sort of service to reach into um, uh, more dis uh, rural um, geographic areas. But the second and third highest were Vancouver Coastal and Fraser, which are the two most urbanized health authorities. Um, yeah, excellent. Uh, so that, that was a bit, uh, so it's not just about fixing the, the ge geographic distribution of services. Great, thank you so much. Um, there we go. Okay, so that this is, then you can see that, and, and then, so the Q1 to Q5 shows that there really isn't any pattern by socioeconomic status. Um, and it's, interestingly, you're slightly more likely to use these virtual visits if you have at least one or more major chronic diseases. Now in terms of physicians, it's very much the same. There's no um, sex difference in the likelihood of physicians providing the service, but a relatively low number of them are doing this at all. But again, physicians tend to be younger. And then I, I'm not going to go into the details, but we have this measure of whether you look like you're a full service primary care uh, provider or somebody who looks more like a walk-in clinic, which would be the low category here. And you can see that the people who look like more like walk-in primary care physicians are more likely to be offering these virtual visit services. And then this is a bit consistent with, with a patient survey result, which showed that if people didn't have access to this virtual visit, they would have gone to a walk-in clinic instead. So we started thinking that it would be important to, to look at, in, your, in this virtual visit environment, are you seeing somebody that you already have a relationship with, and this is just an extension uh, of that relationship, or are you seeing somebody new? And what we found is that about third, 35% of those visits are with a known provider, but two thirds are with somebody that you haven't seen before. So we wanted to dig into that a little bit further and say, okay, so who's seeing a known provider? And what you see here is that um, older people and people who are more, uh, have more chronic diseases are more likely to see a known provider. So it looks like there's at least some tendency where if you have significant health issues that, um, that you're actually connecting with um, somebody that you have seen in a non-virtual setting, so in an in-person interaction. Um, <laughs> oh, really?
no audio. We call this study the Doctors Without Pants study. <laughs> okay. So, so just to carry that um, that a little further, it's really kind of interesting to try to tease apart like who's seeing a known provider, who's seeing a new provider. So I just I kind of highlight this here, where there's this really significant difference. The people who are, are seeing somebody who is not known to them already are often asking about contraception or getting contraception advice. So that seems to me to be very deliberate. You're probably having this visit because you don't want your regular primary care um, physician to know what's going on, as opposed to having um, older people with chronic conditions um, having it be more of an extension of their regular source of care. So there's, there's, there's kind of tells you that there's different motivations here. So in terms of a time series analysis, now in general a time series, what we're looking for is this is the test of whether this is a complementary or a substitute sort of service. And so this first graph shows the, the comparison of people who see, um, who uh, contrasting patients with a virtual visit and, and, a, and a traditional visit. So this is comparing people who use the virtual services to people who never had a virtual visit but had some interaction with primary care around the same time. And what you see here is, is by no means definitive. We would like to have longer follow-up period, but it, it, it looks like it's a suggestion that the virtual visits actually do have a, a positive effect. There certainly doesn't seem any evidence of a negative effect on overall cost of primary care, and this is just cost of primary care. This looks at patients seeing a known GP versus a new GP. And here I would say, I mean, this is again, this is not, we'd like to have higher end, we'd like to have a longer follow-up period. And clearly there's probably something different about the, um, the reasons for, uh, we, uh, let me put it this way, we know that people who are seeing a known GP are sicker and older. So that partly explains that upward slope ahead of time. But it looks, again, suggestive that seeing a known um, GP is a little bit better in terms of outcome, or at least suggestive of that, than seeing a new GP, because you see there's, a, there's an uptick, but that kind of ratchets back down, as opposed to this um, kind of increasing uh, cost there. So some main messages. Um, virtual care is increasing for sure. Younger people are the people who are using it. Younger physicians are the people who are providing it. There isn't a distinctive pattern by geography, so this is not just about filling in those gaps in care that we know exist in rural and remote areas. Um, it seems like, I would say, this is really much very driven by physician choice. If you have a physician who's offering these services, you might take advantage of them, but many, many physicians just aren't. Um, just over a third of patients who have a, a virtual visit see somebody that they have seen in the past, which means that they are seeing somebody new. Um, and, it, and like I said, there's some suggestion that virtual care could help control overall costs. Um, and I would say as well, and importantly, this is one means by which we could make primary care more patient-centered. Um, because it is more convenient for patients, it does take a lot less time, it is far less disruptive to be able to have a virtual me mediated visit than it is to go to an office and sit in the waiting room. Now, just a, a little addendum to the story. This is what happened again. There was just let's say, continuing massive increase to 2014-15, and then it, you can see it, it really tapers off in 2015-16. It's an interesting story. Happy to talk about it in, in the question period. Um, but what I'm going to say from that for now is that implementation matters. I think what happens here is a change in implementation, which changed the uptake of the service itself. And, and I will leave it at that. Thank you so much for the opportunity to do this. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we'll do questions at the end. We'll have all three of our presenters uh, come up. My favorite video series, the first time I used it, I was connected to a Canadian doctor who was posted in Thailand doing a humanitarian mission. So she was speaking to me from Bangkok, and it turned out to be my old next door neighbor. So it was like a big world made very, very small. Uh, next up is Mark Gilbert. He's going to be talking about the uh, BCCDC's Get Checked Online program. Welcome, Mark. Thanks, Jen. Okay, well, it's a pleasure to be here talking today and speaking uh, with such distinguished colleagues on this topic of technology. Um, so I work in public health, as, and all of us here are interested in public health, and so today we're kind of talking about the future of public health. 
Um, but when thinking about technology, uh, it's often hard to sort of crystallize or define or what that means. And so one of the things that I really liked was a strategy that came out from the United Kingdom earlier this year, um, which was uh, the UK strategy of digital first public health. And I like these definitions. They talk about digital public health being a reimagining of public health, so established using uh, blending established public health wisdom with new digital concepts and tools. That um, by working in digital public health, you're recognizing the rapidly changing context of changing technology, um, exploring new models of public health using technology, and being flexible and resilient, allowing us to adapt our public health practice and improve outcomes. So there's lots of reasons why digital public health uh, and why people are interested in digital public health. Um, it offers uh, unprecedented reach uh, to individuals who are either at higher risk of disease or individuals who are not accessing services or, or finding barriers or face barriers to accessing care. Um, people like the concept of digital public health as being a way of, of tailoring interventions to individuals as well as at the same time offering a standardized intervention. So there's no variability in terms of, for example, how a healthcare worker might deliver the intervention. Um, and they're generally considered cost effective. I think the biggest reason why all of it's sort of as reflected in this tweet, that really, it's really about public health kind of catching up with people's raised expectations now that we're working in an internet era and that the internet is so core to our lives. But we know the reality is not so pretty, uh, and we know just from the example today that technology is not always our friend. Um, and certainly in government and in public health, uh, we, we lag far behind the ball in terms of uptake and adoption of technology, and we often find ourselves in this like catch-up position. So I think uh, you know the the notion of digital public health is really a uh, I think I like how you framed it, Kim, in terms of like it's, it's, there's lots of research coming out, but it's still a limited or developing field, and that's very much the same with digital public health. Um, one of the challenges is that it often gets swamped by the broader notion of e-health, which often is used to refer to sort of sharing of electronic medical records, and so sometimes people can confuse, or it's harder to create a rationale for public health digitally. Um, these are not necessarily uh, interventions that are easy to either develop or deploy. Um, and so what you see in the literature is often pilot programs. You see about uh, interventions that are tried, that are shown to be acceptable or feasible, um, but they're rarely brought to scale. And we really have very poor evidence on population level impacts of digital public health interventions. And so we find ourselves in this catch-22, right? It's hard to make a case for developing an intervention because you can't demonstrate it's effective. But until you've developed it and brought it to scale, you, you can't gather the evidence to demonstrate its effectiveness. So really, uh, I mean, I think that it really begs the question, is digital public health rhetoric, this sort of like rosy view of digital public health and its potential, um, uh, or is it reality? Is that actually something that uh, we can observe and see? So I'm going to, uh, well, before getting into that, I think this also adds um, a, either sort of a growing consensus around what digital public health research requires, because these aren't typical types of interventions that are easy to sort of put into a controlled or randomized controlled trial or other types of trials. Um, and so we have to be thinking about it in a different way. So we have to be, from the get-go, thinking about more than feasibility, thinking about scale-out. We have to be thinking about um, impacts at multiple levels, not just what's at an individual level, but at a public level and a health system level. Um, implementation contexts are key. Um, and so when you have an intervention in different contexts, different places, you might see different effects. It's important to have a multidisciplinary approach. Um, and really one of the key things is when you're developing digital public health interventions is embedding evaluation and research at all stages of the development, right from the very beginning. It's not just a matter of like building something and then evaluating to see if it works. It has to be uh, throughout. So I'm going to talk today about the example of Get Checked Online, um, and which I think helps to demonstrate some of the, uh, how this works. So Get Checked Online is a service that provides access to testing for STIs, um, as well as bloodborne infections, through the internet. So we consider this a virtual clinic of the BC Center for Disease Control where I work. Um, and this is in partnership with the BC Public Health Laboratory and with regional health authorities. And the, the thing about Get Checked Online is that it's really integrated within current clinical and public health practices. It's not a standalone intervention. So just from the get-go, I'm going to say that I, I have the pleasure of often coming and talking about Get Checked Online, but I'm really uh, here representing a very wide, <laughs> large number of people who've been involved with the development of this intervention. Um, and a lot of uh, partner agencies, um, uh, in particular we partner with uh, Dean Shubler and the uh, Youth Central Health Team around some of the research activities, but also with health authorities, um, uh, as well as uh, you know, with uh, some CHR funding. So I'm going to just quickly, in sort of the time, uh, I mean I could probably talk for hours, um, but just to quickly give you a snapshot of kind of what it took, uh, or where we're at today. So. The first thing we did when we were funded for this was in 2009, um, and so we spent the first two years really 
trying to figure out what the program should look like um, and what was needed. So we did all of these activities that are on the screen, um, including doing uh, research studies with youth, with STI clinic clients or gay and bisexual men, doing focus groups with providers who worked in the area of sexual health or primary care. We had a consultation group of community organizations for their advice throughout. We spoke to developers about the programs, um, and then we got into all the health authority pieces. So we had to do all of our privacy um, assessments, legal uh, requirements, working with the uh, information management information technology department, the um, health authority that develops these interventions, ethics, equity, consultations. Essentially, it was all, we spoke about this with pretty much everyone that we could think of in order to come up with what we thought was the program model. So this was the next three years, uh, and I'm not going to go into it in detail, but essentially <laughs> going from a plan to actually having it ready to launch. Um, there's a lot of things that you have to do and a lot of uh, barriers to this type of intervention, which is one of the things about that graph I showed about government <coughs> lagging behind, is that often with this intervention, we wound up having to develop many new things within our health authority, new policies, new um, uh, technical infrastructure, and all of these things take time. Uh, it's described in this article if you want all the word details. So let me tell you how it works. Um, so this is just a thousand foot view. Um, it starts by going to the website, getjectonline.com, um, creating an account. You can be invited by email or uh, if you have an access code to create an account. The next step then is once you've created your account, you complete a risk assessment, um, which sort of has typical questions you get asked in a, in a regular STI testing encounter. Um, and then part of that is giving consent to testing and uh, creating and printing a lab form. Um, the third then is uh, going to a Life Labs, which is our partnering lab for the first our first phase of Get Checked Online, where you submit your specimens. Um, so we collect blood, urine, and swabs for HIV, hepatitis, syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. Um, and then the fourth step is to get your results. So on the left, at, when your results are ready, everyone gets an email to that their results are ready and they log back in. Um, on the left, if all your results are negative, you see all your results online, so there's no interaction with the healthcare provider. Um, in the middle, if one of your results is positive, you see a message. You don't get any of your test results, but you're asked to contact the clinic, and at the same time, the provincial clinic at BCCBC, one of the nurses will be trying to contact you if you've given your phone number. Um, and then the third is if there's a problem with the sample, and then you see that there's a message that for that particular test you need to contact and, and get retested, and they'll sort out what the details are. <clears throat> and then finally, you repeat. Um, and this was something we hadn't really thought about much at the beginning, but it turns out many people are repeating, so we're, we're quite happy about that. So I'm not going to go into, there's many details around the program, what it works, and the kind of information <coughs> and the steps, but feel free to check it out at getcheckedonline.com. But uh, now let me just tell you about the implementation and how it works. So uh, we launched in September 2014, so five years after we were funded. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, we started in Vancouver, working with six Life Labs locations in Vancouver that were uh, generally in the catchment area of the clinic, uh, the clients we saw in our clinics at BCCDC. So we promoted it to our SDI clinic clients, we promoted it to gay, bisexual, and other men, sex with men. We also used it um, as a tool for people who we call deferred testers. So there'd be people who'd be calling into the clinic and they wanted an appointment or showing up and not being able to be seen, um, where if the, if the delay was going to be too long to see them, we would give them a code and they could then um, go online and get tested. So then just over a year later, we started our first expansion, and so we added five communities in the interior with partnership with Interior Health and, and on the island with Island Health. Um, and then how this was promoted in different regions was according to the regional priorities for STI and HIV testing. Um, at this time, we added rectal and throat swabs, which we didn't have in, in the first phase. Um, so here's uh, up until the end of July, so it's not the most recent, um, but it gives you a sense of what happened since we launched. So for the first uh, year or so, I think uh, I, I certainly was quite anxious because it looked like we weren't really getting a lot of uptake. Um, but you can see that over time, so the blue bars are really the, the tests that are done in the Vancouver with the six pilot sites, the six labs in Vancouver. The orange are those that are tested in the island and interior. And we've seen a fairly slow but steady increase in the number of people testing. <clears throat> and this is really in the absence of much in the way of, of promotion. So we haven't had a lot of uh, um, marketing around this. Um, certainly not in Vancouver, there hasn't been any marketing uh, since 2015. So what we've seen is that we have about, um, uh, we've had about over 4,000 people tested by now, and about a third of people are testing more than once, so people are using it repeatedly. And um, we have about a 5% positivity rate, so one in 20 people who are testing are positive, which is pretty high. Um, and, and as you can see, our results here are pretty much according to what we'd expect just from the epidemiology of communicable diseases, with the most common being chlamydia, um, followed by gonorrhea, then syphilis, and HIV. 
we haven't had any hepatitis C tests um, positive yet through the service. So, so that's, that's the kind of information that you get from your program metrics. And so um, we also have a fairly extensive uh, program of research that would look at multiple aspects or multiple impacts. So one thing that we did is that we did a survey amongst uh, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men in uh, August of 2016. This was done at Pride festivals as well as an online survey at the same time and in a testing clinic to, to assess reach, like how many people knew about it, used it. Um, and we found that overall about a third were aware of the service, which isn't bad, but shows that we can do more in terms of promotion. But of those who were aware, we found about 10% had tested, so that's a pretty good uptake. Um, but you can see that um, like very high intention to test or to use Get Checked Online in the future. And interestingly, um, uh, some evidence that there is a lot of, uh, if we think about diffusion of innovation and what are some of the characteristics, like knowing people who use the service or talking about it with your friends are all characteristics influencing uptake. Um, and so we're seeing good evidence that the knowledge is sort of disseminating within networks, again, really in the absence of any uh, formal promotion. <coughs> The, the largest driver of developing Get Checked Online and our biggest reason was about reducing barriers to accessing of STI and, and blood borne infection testing. Now, there's multiple barriers to this around the province and this was the primary driver. And so one of the things that we did was we did a survey comparing users of Get Checked Online uh, to clients who were coming into our provincial STI clinic for testing and we wanted to look at whether there were differences in past experiences of testing barriers between people who tested um, online um, shown sort of in the column on the left, um, and people who tested in the clinic. And so we actually asked about a whole bunch of different factors, including we were asking questions about, you know, people's sort of in, in use of technology and, and many of the things that we actually thought would be different, for example, around technological access, you, um, age, many things actually weren't significantly different between the two groups. <clears throat> but we did find clearly that there were significant differences when it came to barriers to accessing testing in the past, including um, being more likely to have reported delaying testing in the past year due to clinic distance and overall, actually. Um, and then um, more likely to say that, or less likely to say that they found clinic hours to be convenient or easy to make an appointment, more likely they had to wait a long time to see a doctor or nurse. Um, and then, uh, so those are really barriers related to sort of accessing a clinic. Um, and then a number of barriers related to sort of the interaction with the healthcare provider, um, being uncomfortable discussing sexual history, um, either with any healthcare provider or where they usually go for care, or fear of being judged by a health provider when providing sexual history. Mm -hmm. Kind of with what Kim had said about sort of contraceptive advice to telehealth, um, and agreeing it was embarrassing to test for STI or HIV. So with that quantitative data, we also paralleled it um, by doing uh, interviews. So um, uh, working with the youth sexual health team, we did interviews with youth as well as uh, gay bisexual and other men and such men who have used Get Checked Online. Um, and in both groups, um, the motivation was around the convenience, not having to wait, um, privacy and anonymity, avoiding judgment. So again, probably closely triangulating with the survey data of what we saw. Um, but some differences between the groups, so youth perceiving Get Checked Online as modern or the future, um, while <coughs> gay bisexual and other men and such men uh, saw it as a way of having increased control over the tests that are ordered, as well as um, decreasing anxiety because of the ability to get the results faster. Um, and then for some rural men, it was a way to get tested without having to come out and disclose sexual orientation to a test to their healthcare provider. So again, speaking to some of the, the advantages of these types of services and breaking down barriers are related to stigma and, and um, uh, adverse um, experiences with accessing healthcare. We also, uh, and uh, just the college didn't totally work out, but um, the purple is in Vancouver compared to the island in the interior. Um, so here, for the most of the past year, all of most of 2016, we looked at um, comparing the client characteristics, accessing the service, and the two, comparing those two different groups. Um, and you can see a couple of things. So we can see that people who are using Get Checked Online are reporting risk factors like condomless sex, uh, condomless sex prior STIs, for example. But seeing some really important differences between the two groups, particularly looking at the past history of testing. So in Vancouver, um, about 9% of Get Checked Online users said that they hadn't ever tested before for an STI or for HIV, but that, that went up to 16% and 22% in the island of the interior. Um, so clearly, that's where implementation context really comes into play, because we know that there's different availability of testing services in, in those different regions and trying to understand that more. So I feel that we've, uh, we're on our way to demonstrating the reality of the impact of Get Checked Online. Um, we're not stopping there, so our next phase, um, we are currently in progress, uh, we have discussions in progress regarding further expansion on the island and in the interior, and then we're starting to have conversations with other health authorities about expansion. 
Um, we also just received a $2 million uh, CHR implementation science team grant for the next five years that will allow us to really um, understand more about the implementation context of Guest Chicken Online as it continues to scale up. We're going to be looking at um, evaluating that continuing expansion, uh, trying to understand um, what makes it successful or not in different regions, different populations. We're adapting it to different languages, um, looking in particular how um, a digital tool um, may, we, we have perceptions around, for example, digital divides and that there may be some people who are not able to use it and we really want to look at that question seriously and look at people who are more marginalized about their, what they think about the model. We're also partnering with folks in uh, Toronto about seeing whether this is an intervention that can feasibly translate it there. And I will <coughs> Uh, and to increase vaccine literacy. 
So we came up with uh, iBoost Community, and uh, it launched in April of 2016 during National Immunization Week. And again, this was um, to try to raise the tide, let's just say, of vaccine literacy. Um, because, you know, for vaccines to work anywhere, they, they have to be everywhere. And so we've kind of tapped into this idea of local and global and uh, um, kind of coming together. So whether, you know, you're in any of these places, uh, there, there's a, um, a common need there for, to vaccinate. It's, it's not only the right thing to vaccinate in your community here, it's the right thing to vaccinate over in, in the global south or wherever that, wherever that might be. Um, not only because it's the right thing to do, but we don't want, you know, with airplanes being what they are, we don't want diseases coming uh, here. And that happens. Um, so I'm going to show you a little video on obvious community because it's simpler for for me to uh, do that than true or false. Vaccines are just for kids. False. You earned one vaccine. What if? By taking an online quiz, you could vaccinate a child in another part of the world. A simple act locally to vaccinate globally. Here's how iBoost Immunity works. Take a series of quizzes about every aspect of vaccination and the diseases they prevent. Each right answer earns a vaccine for a child in support of UNICEF Canada. One right answer one vaccine. There are other ways to earn vaccines. Share our articles on social media about the importance of immunization in your community. Or tell your story to encourage others to get immunized. And you can vaccinate a child against polio. Or immunize a child against measles, giving them a chance for a healthier life. Join us and add your voice to the vaccine conversation in your community. Act locally, vaccinate globally. Take the iBoost Immunity Quiz Challenge today. So, rather than me tell you what it is, I figured I'd do that because it's uh, simpler. Um, so, this is the site. Um, so you can see there's 568,332 vaccines earned thus far. Hopefully there'll be a few more after today. Feel free to ignore me and just go on the site and ask questions. <laughs> um, so you can see, you can take a quiz, you can share an article. One of, you know, one of the criticisms about social media is that liking something doesn't actually do anything. Um, if you like these articles and share them, uh, we basically uh, curate curate uh, vaccine-related uh, articles and, and topics from around the world, whatever's happening right now. Um, and it's flu season, so we did something on flu. Um, if you share it to Facebook or Twitter, you'll learn a vaccine. Uh, what really drives the site, though, in terms of vaccination is um, uh, the quizzes. So taking quizzes, people love online quizzes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, which friend are you? Uh, um, which friend's character are you, or whatever? So we do it. Uh, we do it obviously in the vaccination space. So there are hundreds of, hundreds of questions you can you can take. You kind of level off. They get a little bit harder as you go. Um, and uh, once you get to level three, they're pretty challenging. But you know we've had uh, we've had folks do over a thousand questions, which takes about fifteen hours actually of time. Oh, 1,500 questions. Holy. <laughs> so. Um, and uh, you know that yeah, that's ten or fifteen hours of your of your life. So um, <laughs> that's that's a pretty big commitment. Um, and uh, yeah, and I don't have time to get into the evaluation, but our, our metrics have been really really solid around uh, increasing knowledge, attitudes and beliefs around vaccination, sort of pre and post. Um, and how do I get back to the? Oh, I just go. These questions are easy. <laughs> yeah, they start easy. That's so something crap, you in. 1964, I need help. <laughs> um, 
upgrades. So it's a marathon. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, I, I, historically I've done these sort of quick, quick campaigns. You'd spend a bunch of money and hopefully get some good results. But um, we're, we're looking at uh, kind of a five-year commitment uh, on this to, um, to see what we can do. So uh, quickly, we, you know, after we started running this for about a year, we find we got kind of all the bugs worked out. It's a pretty complicated website that way because we have, I think we have about 12,500 people registered to the site so far. We do want your email, so if you do these questions, it's like, hey, I've just earned five vaccines, but after five, we go, hey, give us your email, and then you will donate them. So then you get to feel bad if you don't. <laughs> you email. Just, I'm doing my email uh, as you speak. <laughs> good, good. Um, so we're totally guilting you into it. So anyway, we, we, after we got the bugs worked out, we said, why don't we try this in schools? We had this idea, but we wanted to make sure that the platform was stable enough before we did that. So we did. During National Immunization Week 2017, we tried something called Boost for You um, in schools, and we essentially just cloned the site adapted it somewhat, added some, we curated some material from around the world on um, uh, vaccination topics for kids. A couple of videos from Australia, Digital Comic out of Ontario, some stuff that we had as well. Cobbled something together and uh, tried it. And uh, it was for one week, we did it in nine schools. Uh, we had about 750 students do it, 21 teams, so the teacher would create a team for their, for their class. We had 92,000 questions answered and 60,000 vaccines earned in a week in nine schools. So just to put that in context, we have got 550,000 vaccines earned um, in, a, in 18 months uh, for the for Ivy's community. In a week, we had 60,000 vaccines earned, 90,000 90, questions. In Ivy's community, we've got about 700,000 questions answered now uh, uh, collectively, which would make a great master's thesis, I think. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, you know, the average was 118 uh, questions per student, which is very, very high. Um, and the top team earned 12,600 vaccines, and it was one class. Um, so the metrics were really, really good on um, uh, increase in knowledge, uh, increase in support uh, for immunization, and, and then probably most important, it met the learning outcomes of the teachers. So. Um, you know, just a, a few comments. The, the plan is now is we're going to be implementing it uh, <coughs> across BC and uh, and uh, beyond. But um, you know, one of the things that really blew me away ar around that week was uh, we we realized uh, that thirty over thirty five percent. I think it was about thirty five percent of the activity actually happened outside of school hours. So the kids were going home and doing it, and. Uh, that one class that actually a bunch of the kids gained the system and created multiple accounts and did all the questions again. <laughs> three times. Who does the homework three times? Um, so it was part of the competition. They wanted to be number one uh, and they wanted to get the most vaccines and their kids and they're just so darn enthusiastic about everything. It's wonderful. Um, so, you know, what drove them what, in our analysis wasn't that they wanted to become smarter about vaccination as much as I would love that. It was that they wanted to help other kids. The number one reason was that. Number two was they liked doing quizzes. And number three, four, and five were like, yeah, okay, we'll become smarter, maybe. Um, so for us, that's, we're not in this to be a global NGO. That's not our, our end game here. Our end game is to increase vaccination literacy. But what we stumbled upon was this is the real powerful catalyst to do that. And so uh, we're going to be, we're, uh, it was called Booster U, but we didn't like that name, so we, we changed it to Kids Boost Community. We're going to be launching it in, in January um, with a soft launch of the pilot schools, and then farther out into BC, um, targeting grade eight science and grade six social studies. We're going to be integrating the, the, the trick we think to getting this to actually fly will be integrated into the social studies and science curriculums. Science is an obvious fit. Social studies is a fit because they study role of NGOs and global health. And so there's a fit there for UNICEF. Um, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll be promoting it through public health, uh, science teachers, librarians, so associations, uh, et cetera. Uh, we're just finalizing a partnership now with the Public Health Agency of Canada to expand it across the country. They really like the pilot results, so um, we're going to be doing that. And uh, our evaluation is uh, to measure um, 
you know, changes in knowledge, the vaccine, vaccine rates, we hope we can actually start to measure that as well, you know, by looking at schools that have the intervention, what their vaccine rate is historically, and then um, comparing it to when they've had the intervention in the school, as well as, you know, comparing schools that have had this uh, to schools that haven't, kind of a province-wide, being the control group. Um, and building us a local and sustainable model for growth, that is going to be our biggest concern because um, the vaccines get paid for through sponsors uh, and partially through, through some of our, our promotions funds as well. But, um, you know, with 60,000 vaccines in a week, that costs us about $8,000. Um, that's not sustainable for uh, province-wide, certainly, uh, let alone nationwide. So um, we've got a, a very, very, uh, one of our pillars of sort of our plan is to do what we call business development, but essentially it's to find sponsors. Someone to go out there and find sponsors for us. Um, and that's it. Thank you, Ian. Um, I'll invite all three of our, you can get to leave yet, um, all <laughs> three of our speakers to stay up here for some questions. Uh, I've got three that have come in online already, and it, equitably, there's one for each of you. Um, so let's go in the order that people presented in. So the first question is for Kim, and that is, uh, is there any impact of telehealth on frequency, not cost, per se, of GP visits? Great question. Um, it, I would just say that we, we looked both at number of visits and overall cost of primary care, and the answer was nearly identical. So um, to the extent that you saw a little bit of difference in the cost, that was really about being small differences in the number of visits. Pretty much the same thing. Thank you. Next question is for Mark. Uh, any thoughts on whether get checked online type paths will always be a separate path for those reluctant to see and trust a healthcare provider in person, or whether the online path might be a bridge to promoting a crossover to see a provider for some later aspects of care? No, that's a great question, and that's something that we had sort of hypothesized around Project Online is that it may be a way of first engaging with people and then uh, accessing care. I mean, one of the things about Project Online is that it's intended for people who don't have symptoms um, or people who don't have are in contact. And so, uh, for example, if people um, answer yes to those questions, they're asked to let come to a clinic and try to direct them into a clinic. Some of what we've been starting to look at is testing patterns of people who test on Get Checked Online. We do see some people who like, test it on Get Checked Online and then they test in a clinic or then they like come back to Get Checked Online. And so, so we are seeing some of that, that engagement and that's part of the idea as well. I mean, we, we see this kind of a spectrum. There's going to be some people who will only want to access care online and some people who will only want to do it in a clinic. But there's a gray area in the middle and that's where we think it comes in. Awesome. Uh, next question, and also, um, of assistance is for <laughs> Ian. Um, and this is a question that comes from David Birnbaum, who asks, uh, what is the communication strategy to grow global awareness of the iBoost immunity website and project? Here comes the offer. We published a theme issue on vaccine-preventable diseases in the third quarter of 2017, issue of the International Journal of Health Governance, and he'd be happy as the editor to discuss promoting their project in the future <laughs> issues. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you've got the question and the offer. Uh, it will help you out. And you to know what's the communication strategy to grow global awareness of the project? Uh, yes, yes, we'll do that, yes. Um, uh, so, you know, one of the things with this project is it's, a, you know, started in BC, and that's all, that will always be our home turf. So whenever we promote IBUS community, we kind of have a BC first strategy. So we do things like, actually, Facebook is actually our biggest bang for their, our buck in terms of getting folks to, to register to the site. So we don't just want you to come to the site and skulk around, we want you to go do some questions and then enter your email because we're trying to build a network of folks, like-minded folks, who are pro-vaccine, that we can call upon when if there's an outbreak over there, we can say, hey, boosters, we call them boosters, hey boosters, you should be aware of this. Um, because, uh, and by that, that actually takes time. So, so for us, it, our strategy is kind of BC first, Canada second, the world third. But we think if we can, if we can get uh, national or international exposure to IBUS community or kids boost community, that will help BC. It's sort of a you know a local, global, local uh, kind of approach, and we think that will benefit BC if we can get uh, national exposure or international exposure. So I mean the communications we do. 
we have uh, boosters registered from about 25 countries, um, you know, and we don't limit that. Uh, our top team is actually a German team, believe it or not. The Germans always have to be number one. Right? <laughs> um, and the second or third is an Israeli team. So we have uh, folks from all, all around the world, and that's kind of been our approach with this, is, is to not say, oh, we're not going to let you in because you're not from, from British Columbia, because that kind of goes against the spirit of this you know, local, global approach when it comes to vaccine um, distribution, because we are buying UNICEF vaccines and go go everywhere. So. Thank you. Uh, questions from in the room. Mariana. Uh, Oh, yeah, I'll run that to you. <laughs> Phil Donahue mode. <laughs> Thanks, all three of you. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, I guess my, my question is for Ian. In terms of, uh, so ultimately, I guess you're trying to do some cultural shift in language that's on social media or that sort of thing. I also see that you're ultimately interested in kind of health behavior change, right? So promoting vaccines. Um, what we've seen in a lot of public health interventions is the assumption that increasing knowledge will lead to behavior change, and we all know that that doesn't work that way. You need some kind of elaborate health behavior change theories where you've thought about all of those things. So I'm just wondering if you've given any thought to that and what you're, what you're thinking about. Great question. Yes, we, you know, uh, that's one of the things that keeps me up at night, that, that how you make that kind of leap from knowledge to behavior change. And as you know, there's no easy answer to that. Um, it's a difficult line to connect. Um, you know, w one of the things that we actually, as part of our evaluation, we do ask about that and uh, from our boosters. And so we actually use the tool, um, which is a quiz tool. We have a quiz tool. So we use, uh, we give them another quiz and say, hey, help us evaluate. And we do ask questions around, um, uh, for example, have you talked to someone about IBUS immunity? Have you changed your behavior at all in, in any way? Um, but we're doing that at a very, very small scale. Uh, IBUS immunity is a big idea in that we're trying to raise literacy in, around uh, the population. And uh, um, we do have something, though, that, that we did a kind of a, a pre-survey um, pre before we started IBUS immunity, um, asking around, uh, things having to do with health behavior. And our plan is in the next six months to a year to kind of do, now that obviously the community is somewhat matured, uh, to do a post survey to see if uh, health behavior has changed. But Ian, you're, you are assessing vaccine uptake. You've assessed vaccine uptake in the Squamish schools. Uh, yes, yes, somewhat. Um, but it's still very, very early days. Yeah. There's opportunities for that in terms of actual uptake of vaccines in schools. And that you're not just talking to the choir, right? But the people who already believe. Uh, yeah. Well, we sort of are, actually. Uh, and that's one of the criticisms of Ivy's community is that they tend to be pro-vaccination. But uh, our, our plan is that, yes, we want them to uh, get off their butts and talk to their friends who maybe aren't as pro-vaccine. So we want to use them as enablers to actually get to where we need to go. Um, we don't have very many anti-vaxxers coming on the site, surprisingly enough, because, oh, we didn't. They just have vaccines. They do anything. They're running vaccines for UNICEF, which is, no. Uh, so uh, we are kind of preaching to the choir with the Kids Boost Immunity. It's a blank slate. The kids really don't know a whole lot about vaccination at all, actually. And uh, so we, we think the potential for change in knowledge with, with kids is way, way higher, um, as well as for, we, we also have a mechanism to directly change or measure at least changes in health behavior, vaccination rates, because we're doing it in the schools and we vaccinate in schools. So we're, we're hopeful that uh, we can show some change there. I'll take one more super fast one. Kazi had a question. Okay, I think this is Okay, shout it. We'll repeat it. You said that implementation matters. I'm just curious if you have any clues on what's happening. Like <laughs> oh, good, because that was my question too. Uh, Kazmer wanted to know from Kim uh, when she referred to implementation matters and that drop off in the telehealth visits. What was it? Yeah. So, so let me see if I can summarize this quickly. So, I, I described the the one company, Medio, which is not the only one offering these telehealth services, but it was the major one that was driving that increase. They got bought 
by another company, and so they changed what I described as that concierge service that they provided. And so, uh, so they, they did two things, the company that bought it, they embedded it in their own proprietary EMR, which is not used very much at all in British Columbia. And then they also used it in a virtual walk-in clinic kind of style arrangement. So it meant that the, that the providers in BC who were really interested in using telehealth visits, virtual visits, as an extension of their relationship with their existing patients no longer had a very easy, clear way to offer that service, to have the concierge, to, and to easily import that information into their um, EMR's clinical records. And so their interest in it, the, the ease of use fell off and their interest in it fell off accordingly. So I think what we're seeing is that flattening out of the, of the interest from people who are wanting it as an extension as opposed to a virtual walking clinic. Really, really, really matters how we take these technologies and put them into practice. Amazing. All right, uh, join me in thanking all of our fantastic speakers for coming out here. We support, have an excellent Friday, and if you want some CME credits, <laughs> thanks everyone.